At one time, tourists in South Florida were a favorite target for criminals. Hundreds of visitors were robbed, some were assaulted, and eight were murdered. It was an out-of-town journalist who made an unexpected journey from tourist to victim to advocate. In September of 1993, Uwe Wilhelm Rockebrand and his wife flew from Germany to Florida to spend their honeymoon. They rented a car for the short trip to their hotel. The two German tourists were less than five minutes from the airport, just time enough to read safety precautions in a visitor's guide when they became the newest victims. A van pulled behind them and ran their car. The couple knew this wasn't an accident, but a ploy robbers use to get drivers to stop their cars. They call it bump and rob, but the Rockebrons did what they were supposed to do and did not stop. Then the gunman pulled alongside and fired a single shot. 33-year-old Uwe Wilhelm was killed instantly. His 27-year-old bride, Catherine, was unharmed. By the end of the year, there were eight tourist murders in South Florida. Hundreds more were robbed and many more seriously injured. Tourists were easy targets. You can't change people's behavior. The lost tourists looking at street signs, the holding up of maps, the camera bags, the luggage in the back seat. You know, it's not too hard to identify a tourist, especially around the airport. And they have what criminals want, cameras, jewelry, video equipment, laptop computers, and they usually carry plenty of cash. Helga Lust covered these tourists' crimes as a journalist for German television. I was working on a piece that was focused on the rash of crime that had taken place in the United States, specifically tourist-directed crime in Florida. And during the course of that uh, piece, we talked about safety tips for German tourists that would be traveling to the United States. Helga and her mother had scheduled their own Florida vacation before the crime spree started. We decided to keep our plans of flying into Miami and then going on to the Florida Keys just for four days, very brief um, stay, but particularly because I had just done this piece about safety tips and felt that my awareness was, you know, pretty strong at that point. Their vacation was relaxing and uneventful. Their return to the airport was not. They got lost looking for the airport rental car area. Helga drove onto a side street to turn around. She soon realized someone was following her. The man reached through the window, put the car into park, disconnected the horn, and assaulted the two. My mother said, take whatever you want, but please don't hurt us. The passenger from their vehicle said, shut up, bitch, we're going to kill you. Both of the perpetrators were coming, taking turns beating me through my window and, uh, you know, every punch um, that I took weakened me. The attackers tried desperately to grab the car keys. I was able to get in a good couple of blows myself. Somehow, Helga got the car into gear and drove away. To try to stop her, the attacker bit her arm. I hit the driver from their car with the front of our car. After a short distance, the man was forced to let go. I had tremendous injuries um, to my head, my neck, my back, dislocated jaw, lost the feeling in my left side of my face, which I've never regained. Um, and uh, the bite wound was um, very painful. The bite wound was deep. It went through the muscle. 
Even animals don't do what he did, the way he did it. Even animals don't do that. There's no need for that. To punch somebody, almost killing, paralyzing her, and biting her, and destroying her life. There's no need for that at all. Helga described the attackers as young men, approximately 25 years old. They were driving a large, dark-colored car with tinted windows. Most crimes happen and take place in less than two minutes. It's a hit, it's a theft, it's, a, um, it's an assault, and it happens in a matter of just seconds. So a positive identification of a suspect might be difficult. With no other witnesses or leads, police hoped Helga's car would contain the forensic evidence they needed. In 1993, 24-year-old Helga Luce barely escaped with her life after a harrowing encounter with two men who attempted to overpower her. Two veteran detectives, Bassam Fidel and Laura Lefave, with the Hialeah, Florida robbery squad, were assigned to the case. And this particular robbery happened about 10 blocks north of the airport into Hialeah into a mixed residential commercial uh, neighborhood. That neighborhood surrounds Lejeune Road, the only exit or entrance to the airport. Here, criminals often lie in wait for their victims. It's the main artery. It's easy to hide. It's easy to follow. One way in and one way out of Miami International Airport. They're hunters. They're hunting for robbery victims. It could have been your family. It could have been anybody in the community. I'm sure as they followed her and they tailed her and targeted her, um, the discussion was how, how were they going to do it and when were they going to do it, uh, in what manner. At the time, rental cars were easily identified with stickers of the rental company and special license plates beginning with the letter Y or Z. Despite the increase in tourist crimes, South Florida's overall crime rate was less than the previous year. Nevertheless, the press coverage had an impact. Miami was being hit with tourist robbery cases almost on a daily basis. This was a city that they viewed as a violent city, and uh, they had no interest in coming back here. European governments discouraged travel to Florida, and hotel reservations dropped by 25%. Ending the crime spree was difficult. Victims were often unwilling to return to Florida for court hearings and trials. This kept criminals on the streets. Most of the crimes were bump and rob, leaving behind little forensic evidence. But Helga's robbery had been unusually violent. She had a bite mark located on her upper arm, and it was rather clear. I have a sexual battery background, and know that they were developing bite mark comparison techniques. And the state-of-the-art place to process her was the photo lab at the medical examiner's office. She was very sharp to immediately address that before the victim left, or before the victim sought treatment, perhaps uh, sutures or uh, other medical treatment which can damage or alter the bite marks on the victim's arm. Helga agreed to have a forensic photographer take pictures of the wound. It's not enough just to take a photograph. It has to be measured properly. It has to be put into perspective. It has to be documented properly. It's important to get it done as quickly as you can. Things change very rapidly. Skin tends to discolor. Bruising tends to set in. In every picture, Forensic protocol requires the use of a ruler to provide scale. It's an L ruler. It has uh, three circles on it that allows us to make sure that our camera is perpendicular to our subject. And that will also give us a, a sense of scale. So we take the flash and we hold it off to an angle where we can emphasize the surface texture of the skin. And forensic photographers take pictures under many different light sources, conventional light, ultraviolet, infrared, and fluorescent. These show detail and texture not revealed by light in the visible spectrum. Many times there's something there that you can't see with the naked eye. 
Afterwards, investigators examined the rental car, hoping to find fingerprints. But unfortunately, the weather was against us. Processing the outside of the vehicle was impossible. The car was wet because Helga had driven through a thunderstorm on the way to the airport. The interior material was textured, which yielded no usable prints. No fingerprints, no witnesses, and no suspects. Helga and her mother left Miami not knowing whether the crime would ever be solved. And maybe it wouldn't have been had the perpetrator not left behind a piece of forensic evidence. Three weeks after Helga Luce's assault, she was asked to return to Florida to look through stacks of mug shots. She didn't see her attacker. Then, the detective showed her a photo array of six suspects. Helga looked at the lineup, and then she would look at each picture carefully. And once she got to his picture, to Stanley Cornett's picture, and you see an immediate reaction in her, uh, physically an immediate reaction. When I saw the defendant's face, um, it was a very, very weird mix of emotions, one of joy because I found him, and one of complete terror because it was the first time I had seen that face since it was locked on my arm, biting through the muscle. 24-year-old Stanley Cornett was a factory worker with a long criminal history. Since the tourist attacks happened in different jurisdictions near the airport, police formed a task force to exchange information. That's how Lefebvre first learned about Stanley Cornett. He was arrested a few days after Helga's attack for a nearly identical crime. He allegedly stopped an elderly man in a rental car and robbed him at gunpoint, but he picked on the wrong man. The victim's son was a Miami policeman who lived just across the street. He called for his son, and he came running out of the house. Well, a struggle ensued, and the victim tried to hold back the robber while he was calling for his son. And the robber at that time bit him, bit him in the upper arm. The similarities in the crimes were striking. But despite the identification, Cornett denied he assaulted Helga Lust. I had tried a number of these cases previously, and the issue was always whether the identification was enough to pass muster with a jury, especially on a, on a case where all you have is a single ID and a robbery case where, where it took no longer than 20, 30 seconds. So investigators wanted to know if there was any way to tell whether Cornette was the man who bit Helga's arm. To find out, police went to the same forensic expert who matched a bite wound to the notorious serial killer, Ted Bundy. From a bite mark, if it's a good one, you can actually get a dental profile of the suspect. For instance, an outline of what his teeth look like, if there's a gap or crooked teeth or whatever. That profile can exclude a suspect or increase the likelihood that he made the bite mark. Dr. Suveron had the photos of Helga's bite wound, but he needed Cornette's dental impression for comparison. Cornette refused to cooperate. You're not going to touch me, basically is what he said. Just basically, you know, you're not getting anything out of my mouth, except maybe the swear words. They left empty-handed, but returned later with a court order specifying the use of force if necessary. At which time he reiterated that he didn't want to cooperate and he wasn't going to open his mouth. And Dr. Suveron very casually brought out what's called a jaw jack for um, opening the jaws of cadavers that are in full rigor mortis. You can put it in a jaw and you ratchet on this thing and it, it'll open in you. It'll break your jaw if you try and resist hard enough. When Stanley was shown the jaw jack, Stanley decided he wanted to cooperate and supplies with dental impressions. And so uh, we obtained our dental impressions from Stanley Cornett. From those impressions, Dr. Suveron made these plaster models, which allowed him to duplicate the bite patterns. 
test bites are made either in wax or in styrofoam to be able to analyze the patterns that these teeth are going to leave. For further evaluation, the biting edges of the plaster teeth are blackened and the pattern copied onto a clear acetate for easy comparison with the photographs. Odontologists use a number of different techniques because there's no way to accurately estimate the elasticity of the victim's skin. The teeth have variables, the skin has variables, and when uh, this lady was bitten, she didn't just sit there and let this man, you know, bite her as hard as he could. We're showing this is a dynamic uh, bite with movement going on, and teeth numbers 24 and 25 made the marks that these arrows pointed to, and then as the bite moved, the 26 tooth and made that mark. There is no such thing as a bite impression match. All experts can say is whether a bite wound is consistent with a person's teeth. Even if they are, it's still not 100% certain. But with the model, wax impression, acetates, and precision photographs, Dr. Suveron zeroed in on three lower teeth in the bite mark, which were slightly crooked and overlapping. And there was a deep mark made by an upper tooth. Even to untrained eyes, it looked like Cornette's teeth caused the bite wound in the photographs. Dr. Suveron was confident in his assessment. His teeth were consistent with that bite, and there was nothing there that could exclude him. Stanley Cornett was charged with attempted robbery and aggravated battery. But Cornett said he was innocent and that he had an alibi. A jury would have to decide which side they believed, the alibi or the bite impression evidence. The ironic situation of having done a news piece about safety tips and then going to Florida and becoming part of the crime statistics. Even when you think you have all the tools at your disposal to keep yourself safe, if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, anything can happen. As the trial approached for the brutal assault of Helga Luce, Stanley Cornett claimed he had an alibi, that he had been at work at the time of the crime. His work record showed that he was indeed at work that day. But Cornett's co-worker said he didn't always punch the time clock when leaving for a break, and he worked just 10 minutes away from where Helga was attacked. His supervisor remembers that day in particular and remembered he left and never came back. He was soon after let go out of that job because of that. So that um, melted that alibi. It's incredible that an individual would punch a time card, go to work, like we all do in the morning. And uh, he, he would leave during his break and go commit a violent crime against a tourist. But that's precisely what Stanley Cornett did. Through various legal tactics, Cornett kept delaying his trial. If my victim doesn't want to cooperate, then I have no case. And that's what these criminals count on. That's why they target the tourists. And in this case, they picked the wrong tourist. And Stanley Cornett was relying on wearing Helga Luce down to the point where she just gave up. He underestimated Helga Luce. She wasn't going to wear down. She came back for every trial date, every appointment she flew back for. At the trial, Helga again identified Cornett as the man who attacked her. Facing Stanley Cornett in court was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Through all of my testimony, the defendant had a smirk on his face. So I tried really hard not to focus on him and to focus on the prosecutor and the jury and the judge and the people that were there to embrace justice. The clarity of the bite impression photographs taken by a qualified forensic photographer alongside the cast of Cornette's teeth were what ultimately convinced the jury. Stanley Cornette was found guilty of attempted robbery and aggravated battery. Because he was a repeat offender, he was sentenced to life in prison. I tell the detectives, if you have a bite mark case, you don't tell the defendant that you have a bite, because they certainly can alter their teeth. 
It happened to me two weeks ago where the defendant, when I saw him, had had all of his upper and lower front teeth pulled while he was in prison. He told me he had a toothache and they pulled his teeth. As a prosecutor at the time, uh, if it was somewhat new to me, imagine how new it was to a jury. They had certainly never heard of anything remotely similar to bite mark evidence. The bite mark evidence, I think, sealed this case. Um, it put the final nail in Stanley Cornett's coffin as far as the jury is concerned, I think. It was our strongest piece of evidence. Cornett's accomplice in the crime was never identified. By the end of 1993, the crimes against vacation travelers in South Florida stopped. Why? Police increased their surveillance of the rental car areas. Rental agencies removed their stickers from the cars and ended the practice of identifiable license plates. After her ordeal, Helga formed an advocacy group for victims of crime called Witness Justice. She can meet them on a totally different level than a police officer can. And she can advocate for them. She can be their voice when sometimes they can't find their voice. Maybe it'll be the Helgas of this world that make more victims come back to court and get more convictions. 